Hello and welcome to lecture number two. Today's topic will be absolute monarchs and England. A few themes will be addressed in this presentation. First of all, we're going to explore the idea and or the justification for royal absolutism or the evolution of absolute monarchs. We'll look specifically at Louis XIV in France and Peter the Great in Russia. Lastly, we'll also address how and why in England they did not have absolute monarchs. Before we get into some of the specifics, I did want to show a map of Europe in the mid-1600s. Uh, notice um, Italy. It's circled here on the map, but Italy was not unified as a country until the 1800s. Uh, notice the different principalities or the different regions in Italy. Those were separate countries. Um, also, the arrow is pointing to a border around Central Europe, um, and this there was a loose confederation of German states. There was no country of Germany at that time. But this is what the map of Europe looked like in the mid-1600s. Also, I thought that maybe we should look at population. Um, England's population was about 5 million people. Spain's was at about 8.5 million. And France was the largest country in Europe in 1650 with a population of 18 million. Now that we've had a bit of a background and introduction, I'd like to look at the history of absolutism and how it evolved in France. The idea of absolute monarchs having ultimate power was nothing new. In fact, it was quite common in the ancient world. It was common in both Mesopotamia, Egypt, and many other areas. The leader in Egypt was Pharaoh, and in Egypt, Pharaoh was a god on earth. There was no separation of church and state, and in fact, in ancient Egypt, there was no need for written law. Whatever Pharaoh said became law immediately after he said it. One of the most influential advocates of royal absolutism and the divine right of kings is shown here. It's Bishop Bossuet of France. He argued that the Bible could be used to justify the absolute power of monarchs. First of all, he argued that God established kings who reign over the people. And we can see some biblical verses that were used to justify it. The king is the minister of God to thee for good, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Another uh, part of scripture argued that people should submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors. The bottom line was that average people in Europe in the 1600s and 1700s did not question the idea or concept of royal absolutism. In fact, they accepted it. Furthermore, it was also justified by religious leaders. So that's the main reason why people didn't question it. If you wanted to identify the best example of an absolute monarch in Europe during this era, it would be the person shown here, Louis XIV. In fact, he set the record for being the longest serving monarch in Europe's history. Technically, he became king at the age of five, although a regent ruled in his place until his early 20s. During his reign, France was Europe's greatest single power. While Louis XIV may have towered over Europe, one piece of trivia is that he was quite short. He was only about five foot four inches tall. I'd like to identify a range of examples of Louis XIV's absolute power. The first of these would be the Palace of Versailles. In many ways, this was a temple, kind of like the pyramids from ancient Egypt. This was a temple to a monarch in Europe in the 1600s. Estimates differ as to the exact cost. However, it's believed that at least half of the income of France went to build and maintain Versailles after over a 50-year window of time. On the right, we see a drawing which depicts what Versailles looked like in the 18th century. On the left, we see a YouTube video. What I'm going to do is I'm going to place some hyperlinks on the Canvas site to some YouTubes. I think that you'll find those interesting if you've got the time to, to look them over.
I was lucky enough several years ago to make a trip to Versailles. This was specifically designed to intimidate visitors who came. This was an awesome experience for me and um, I wanted to take a, a great photo here as I entered the, the grounds and this stupid car would not move. Uh, I waited and I waited and I waited and I finally said, well, okay, I guess I'll just take the photo with the car. Eh, I think it still looks pretty good. On the left, we see a statue of Louis XIV. Again, everyone had to pass by this as they entered. And on the right, you see my family um, at the entrance to uh, Versailles. Uh, we're there with our uh, former exchange student who lived with us for a year, a few years back. Her name was Christiana. It was an awesome experience to see this palace. Um, the lines were really long, though. You can see those on the right. Uh, on the left, you see even the water fountains were elaborate. Um, notice the attention to detail uh, just in a place where you can get some water. Again, this was designed to intimidate any visitor so that if there was some sort of a trade deal, if there was some sort of a military treaty that had to be signed, um, that any visitor to Versailles would be intimidated uh, and they would acquiesce to the French wishes. One of the more amazing features of this temple to the King of France was the Hall of Mirrors. This is an incredibly long hallway, over 200 feet long, 40 feet wide, and its ceiling was 34 feet tall. It was amazing. And just think about this is an era where they didn't have electricity and it, there was a very bright um, uh, light that would come uh, from uh, the right side that you see there and lots of mirrors. And it was designed to intimidate any visitor there. Very elaborate works of art um, filled the ceiling as well as the hallway. The grounds and royal gardens were absolutely spectacular. Um, there were all sorts of things uh, that, that people could see, many different types of unique plants, uh, as well as hedges and different mazes and things like that. And you see a little bit of that here. The Palace of Versailles, or this temple to Louis XIV, wasn't the only example of his absolute power. There were also several wars that Louis engaged in. There were, in fact, four wars between 1667 and 1714 that involved France. Um, to make a long story short, I want to focus on the last one and the most important of these wars, which was the War of Spanish Succession. The spark, which started this war, uh, dealt with uh, the King of Spain. See, the King of Spain died, and he did not have an heir. Louis XIV tried to install his own grandson on the throne of Spain. Again, here we are at that map of Europe in the mid-1600s. Um, the reason why this was controversial, that Louis XIV would try to install his own grandson on the throne of Spain, is that the fear in Europe was that here France was this great power, and it would end up controlling all of Europe, and France and Spain might become unified as one country. We now know today that that's not what happened, but that was a true fear at that time, as it appeared as if Louis XIV was trying to control all of Europe. In order to prevent Louis XIV from dominating all of Europe, an alliance was formed by several countries in order to prevent Louis XIV's grandson from taking over as the leader of Spain. This alliance involved England and the Netherlands as they fought against the French. The leader of this alliance was the King of the Netherlands. His name was William of Orange. Well, I'm going to make a long story short. Early on in Louis XIV's reign, he was very popular. However, by the end of the War of Spanish Succession, the French had lost, and Louis XIV had lost a lot of po popularity. People had to pay more in taxes, poverty increased, and there was a lot of negativity within France. Support for Louis XIV began to wane by the early 1700s, and a symbol began to emerge of the king's oppressive power. It's shown here on the right. This was the Bastille, which was a prison. Often, political critics were taken to this building, and they were held there indefinitely, and they never received a trial. What we see is that support for absolute monarchy over time lessened in France, and we're going to see how it results in a revolution a little bit later in the semester. Now that we've explored absolute monarchy in France, 
Let's move to the east and look at Peter the Great in Russia. On the right, we see a painting of Peter the Great. He was the Tsar of Russia. Um, Tsar would be Russian for the word Caesar, as the Russians tried to hearken back to the Roman Empire of the ancient world. Just a bit of trivia concerning Peter. Peter was six feet eight inches tall, much taller than Louis XIV. Peter the Great's goal was to ensure that Russia would become a great nation. In many ways, Russia was a backward country. It was a second or third tier country in the era that we're discussing. And so he took several steps in order to make Russia a great nation. The first of these steps was to expand Russia's territory. Here we are back at that map of Europe in the 1600s. Um, notice the circled area here. Uh, that shows the Baltic Sea and the countries that border it. Well, uh, when Peter became Tsar, Russia had no access to the Baltic Sea. This hurt Russia's trade. One of the things he wanted to do was to expand Russia's access to the Baltic. In order to achieve this goal, Peter undertook the Great Northern War. This was a war between Russia and Sweden. Notice the arrows here. They identify some of the new territories acquired by Russia during the Great Northern War. Russia was victorious, and it was able to spread its territory to the Baltic. Another example of Peter's attempt to make Russia a great nation involved the capital of Russia. He moved the capital from the traditional city of Moscow to a brand new city, St. Petersburg. Here we see a map of Russia. The arrow is pointing to the traditional capital of Moscow. What Peter wanted to do was he wanted to create a brand new, modern capital. This way he could impress visitors just as Louis XIV could do in Paris at Versailles. And so St. Petersburg, which is on the Baltic, was created as the new capital of Russia. On the left, I'm standing in front of a statue of Peter the Great. On the right, we see the first thing that was built in this new capital of St. Petersburg. It was a military fortress in order to protect the city. The name of it was Peter and Paul Fortress. Peter built his own great palace called the Peterhof. This was modeled in many ways after the Palace of Versailles, and it was designed to try to intimidate any visitors to Russia. It was pretty spectacular to see all of the sights in this great palace. Here's the view from the palace to the water. Here's the view from the back of the palace. Just as Versailles had tremendous gardens and landscaping, so too did the Peterhof. Peter recognized the importance of trying to impress visitors to his home country of Russia, but uh, he didn't like all the pop and pomp and circumstances himself. In fact, he had his own small uh, cabin or house built, uh, and it was built uh, right on this man-made pond. That's where he stayed most of the time. The last step that Peter took in order to try to make Russia a great nation was that he traveled to Europe in what was called the Great Embassy. This was about 200 of his closest advisors who went with him to many different European cities as they tried to learn more and to potentially adopt the technologies of the different countries that he visited. We see a couple of images here associated with the Great Embassy. See, Peter wanted to go to these different countries and travel um, as in disguise, and so he disguised himself as a sailor. And we see that in the upper left-hand corner. He met with engineers, skilled artisans, and he was particularly interested in shipbuilding because what he wanted to do is he wanted to hire a group of experts to come back to Russia to live or, at the very least, to train the Russians in order to build their own items. His goal was to build a fleet of Russian merchant vessels to expand trade. He also wanted to modernize his military and manufacturing, as well as Russian architecture. <laughs>
While on this trip, Peter learned that in many ways, Europeans laughed at the Russians because of the old clothing that they wore and their long beards. This prompted him to issue a pair of decrees. One required the Russian people to wear Western-style clothing, even down to a specific type of underwear. He also required that men would have to shave their beards or pay a fine. On the right, we see a woodcut. This depicts Peter cutting the beard of a noble. Collectively, these three goals show some of the actions taken by Peter to try to modernize his nation. I'd like to look at some images next. Peter took steps to modernize Russia's architecture, and we see this with a cathedral that was built in St. Petersburg. The name of it was Our Lady of Kazan. Does it look a little familiar? In many ways, it was modeled after another cathedral in Rome, St. Peter's Basilica. Another form of architecture that was modernized in St. Petersburg were the different canals. You see a canal from St. Petersburg on the left. On the right, this is a canal from the ancient city of Venice. They look pretty close, don't they? Well, the modernization continues to today. When I went to Russia, we went inside the Golden Arches. They also had Colonel Sanders' favorite chicken. And a movie was playing when I was there, and we see a billboard for it on the right. Next, we'll explore some of England's history and show why and how absolute monarchs didn't really emerge there. England has a strong history of placing limitations on the king, and it goes back to King John, whose reign was from 1199 to 1216. He was a very unpopular king, in large part because he wanted to raise people's taxes. He was so unpopular, no one in the royal family has actually named, been named John since. Well, the nobles eventually agreed to be taxed, but in return, they forced the king to accept limits on his actions or authority. These limitations on the king's actions were forced upon him in 1215 in a document called the Magna Carta. On the right, we see a replica of the Magna Carta, which was given as a gift to the United States in 1976. First of all, if the king wanted to impose any taxes, he couldn't do it unilaterally. Instead, those taxes had to be approved by Parliament. Secondly, the Magna Carta protects justice in England. Anyone accused of a crime had the right to a trial by a jury of their peers. The king si couldn't simply throw someone in prison. Why is this important? Well, it's the cornerstone of England's constitution, and it demonstrates the long tradition and long history of limited power for England's kings and queens. Now that we've looked at a little background uh, and the Magna Carta, which demonstrates the limits on the king's power, uh, I want to look at some conflict and the so-called glorious revolution in England and its legacy. Ever since the Magna Carta, there had been a power struggle between members of the nobility, who were serving as members of parliament, as well as the king. In some cases, this power struggle involved religion. On the right, we see an image of Henry VIII. For centuries, England was a Roman Catholic country. Well, Henry VIII broke with the Catholic Church and founded the Church of England, or the Anglican Church. This map identifies the different religious denominations common throughout Europe in 1600. Notice there were a lot of Lutherans, Calvinists, Roman Catholics, as well as Anglicans. England was divided itself as well. You can see that with the different colors uh, for the UK shown here. While in some cases this struggle over power dealt with religion, in others it was over political power. Should Parliament or the King or monarchy have authority over politics in the country? Conflict on these topics came to a head in England during their civil war in the 1640s, where there was a direct conflict between royalists and supporters of parliament between 1642 and 1648. You can see on this map some of the divisions in the red, those were areas that were controlled by parliament. The yellow areas were controlled by the monarchy.
two key figures in the English Civil War are shown here, and they're also chronicled in your reading in Tidelands. The King of England was Charles I. He, many distrusted him because he had a Catholic wife, and they were concerned that Catholicism would be imposed on them. On the right, we see Oliver Cromwell. He was a strong Puritan who wanted to purify the Church of England from all Catholic influences. He was a commoner originally, but he ended up forming an army, and his forces ultimately defeated those in support of the king. While the fighting ended by 1648, there were still questions as to who had ultimate political authority in England. Was it Parliament or the king? Also, what religion would the people practice, and what would be the state religion? Would it be Anglican, Protestant, or Roman Catholic? Ultimately, these questions were settled in what came to be known as the Glorious Revolution. The Glorious Revolution took place in 1688. First of all, Parliament deposed the King of England, James II, who was Catholic. They kicked him out as the king. Next, they named James's daughter, whose name was Mary and she was a Protestant, along with her husband William to be the new royal family, William and Mary. Now I'm going to take a step back here for a second. I've talked about William earlier. This is William of Orange, who was the king of the Netherlands. He was the guy who led that grand alliance against France. This is the same guy. William and Mary, who became the new king and queen of England, already were the king and queen of the Netherlands. This is quite an action undertaken by England's parliament. These actions are referred to as the Glorious Revolution because, well, not a single person was killed in this revolution. It was glorious because it was bloodless. This also ensured that there would be no absolute monarchs in England because Parliament asserted its authority over the king, and this remained in place. Furthermore, Parliament required that both William and Mary accept limitations on their power in the form of a Bill of Rights. This had a range of provisions to it. I want to highlight a few. First of all, Parliament asserted its authority to either pass or suspend laws. The king did not have the authority to do this. Second, the king couldn't raise taxes nor raise armies without Parliament's consent. Lastly, it prohibited cruel and unusual punishment. The bottom line is that this further protected the rights of English citizens from the government from overstepping its power and authority. Well, we're just about done. I would like to summarize a few of the main concepts involved. Well, this lecture has dealt with the rise of absolute monarchs in France and Russia, as well as the lack of absolute monarchs in England. What you want to be able to do is you want to be able to write an essay which explains the foundation or the justification for absolute monarchy, and then provide some examples by looking at some of the actions of Louis XIV, as well as Peter the Great. Lastly, you'd want to analyze some factors which demonstrates the prevention of absolute power from developing in England. Well, I hope you found this an interesting topic, and I hope you learned something new. Take care, have a good day, and we'll see you again soon.